Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Chris. This is Napoleon's Marshalls uh, B, L, and D. As you can see, this is part six. This is the final episode. I kind of want to go back and rewatch the whole Napoleon series now because I know the Marshalls, so that it'll it'll mean a little bit more, I guess. Make a little more sense because some of these guys I remember the battles, um, but. Uh, if you just watched the last one, uh, is it Ney? I'm terrible at these names, so I do apologize. Ney and Sewell. Uh, Ney was executed, and the more I think about it, the more I'm against his execution. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, only thing I can think of is they believe that him, maybe him, maybe they believed. Him sticking around, maybe he felt he was invincible. They had to set the example. Which is ridiculous because Sewell fled. And the amnesty thing, they welcomed him back. But to me, the guy who flees is, is more guilty than the guy who stays. And so I, I think if you execute one, you execute the other. I think Ney should have been put in jail. I understand why they would have done that, but I'm against the execution part. It, it just, just, I, I just, but I, I can't change anything now. You know, I can protest it. I've, I've written uh, France plenty of emails. I've texted people. No change. You know, he's still dead. So, uh, means nothing apparently. But that's where I stand on that one. But that one has nothing to do with this. This is part six. Um, and I will be kicking the this little fan on. Okay. Just because it's it's just it's it was kind of a it's a muggy day here. It was rainy and and just it's just humid. It's like 75 outside, but the humidity just sucks here. American humidity stinks. Midwest. All the crops, it's just garbage. That's why I live here, I love it. <laughs> All right, let's get into the video and let's see who, uh, well, we know who they have as number one, but let's uh, hear their stories and everything. This has been a really great series. This whole Napoleon thing has been awesome. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Epic History TV's done a great job. I'm glad I did this. Just kind of went off of what I normally do, and I and um, all the subscribers and everything. This has been this has been a fun journey, and um, so let's just keep it going and let's uh, finish out on a high note. And I'm going to tell you again, I'd love to watch Waterloo this weekend. It's Friday right now. It's seven thirty. Will that happen? Probably not. But let's pretend that. I really wanted to and I'm gonna make it happen but don't be shocked if Monday comes around and I tell you I didn't so video time terror belly decus pacis terror in war ornament in peace I just love that saying the words inscribed on every French Marshal's battle In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Key lime pie. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals, with expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Rémy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, 
Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudinot. He's number one to me. 36 bullets. Victor, Murat, Bessier, McDonald, Massena, Suchet, Ney. McDonald was impressive too. Sorry, I muted the mic and then was talking. Uh, McDonald was impressive too. Nay, R.I.P. Bud. We're delighted to welcome back as our video sponsor, NapoleonSouvenirs.com, the online shop for fans of the Napoleonic era. Since 2010, Souvenirs.com for sponsoring this video. Three. Marshal Berthier. Okay. Louis Alexandre. This was his chief of staff, correct? From I'm learning that from the last video. I believe. Berthier was born at Versailles, ten miles from Paris. His mother served at the palace as a chambermaid to the future Louis the Eighteenth. His father was a colonel in the topographical engineers a specialist corps of military surveyors. Berthier followed in his father's footsteps, joining the topographical engineers aged just 13, and was commissioned lieutenant at 17. He proved a talented and diligent staff officer. Ten years later, he accompanied General Rochambeau to America as part of French support to the colonists in their War of Independence. This guy's awesome and witnessed the British defeat at Yorktown. By the time the French... By the way, quick note. Thank you, French people. Thank you for your service to help us win our independence. I know there are some Americans who shit on the French. I never will. I never will. Individually, like some people here, I might go, eh, well, that guy was a piece of shit. But like, in no. Collectively... You'll never hear anything bad from me about them. You guys helped us become an independent company. And look, independent company? Wow. Independent country. And Spain helped. Uh, Portugal helped. The Netherlands helped. What's up, Sam? Um, you know, I mean, it, you, you weren't the only, but you sent, you were the ones, I think, that primarily sent uh, soldiers. So you'll never hear anything bad from me. I pff, love it. I would love to go to France, uh, to Paris, and visit um, Marquis de Lafayette's grave just to have... I'd like to bump into a French person and just hear them cuss me out because I'm an American. I'd be like, yes, it's awesome. Yes, I, I, I am an American swine. I love it. I love the revolutionary guys. wars broke out, Berthier was a brigadier general with 25 years service who'd studied and given much thought to the problems of military organization and command. A reputation for outstanding staff work meant his services were in high demand, and he served as Chief of Staff to Rochambeau, Lafayette and Luckner. Wow. But during the Terror, ties to these politically suspect generals put Berthier himself under the spotlight. He was stripped of his rank and not officially reinstated until 1795, when he became Chief of Staff of the Army of Italy. A Chief of Staff led the Staff Section, which was responsible for turning the General's orders into action, by drafting written instructions which were sent out by courier, as well as every aspect of Army administration, ensuring efficient movement and supply, and collating reports on the enemy, terrain, roads, and anything else that might affect operations. Berthier, building on recent trends in French staff practice, now developed his own comprehensive staff organization. He established three sections. His personal office or cabinet, mostly skilled civilian clerks who handled troop movements, transcribed orders, filed reports, and collated intelligence on enemy forces. His private military staff, made up of aides-de-camp, liaison officers and couriers. And the general staff itself, headed by the first assistant major général, also divided into three sections. 
The first dealt with additional troop movements, plus auxiliary services such as hospitals, military policing, prisoners of war, and security of supply lines. The second section organised the army's camps and billets. The third section was the topographical section, responsible for maps and reconnaissance. The general structure of Berthier's system changed little over the next 18 years, and proved uniquely effective at handling the challenges posed by a new era of European warfare. He seems like he had a lot of... Uh, 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 what, what, what is it? Um... He had, a, he, he had a lot of things to deal with, and he compartmentalized a lot of things, and uh, instead of trying to overstress yourself to just be the guy who needs to do it all. It's interesting. Its chief beneficiary would be the Army of Italy's new commander, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon also discovered that his chief of staff possessed immense personal qualities. A heroic capacity for work, meticulous memory and attention to detail, and devotion to duty and discipline. Crucially, he had a gift for turning Napoleon's verbal, sometimes vague, commandments into clear, concise written orders that made sense to his officers and later marshals. Napoleon and Berthier established a highly effective working relationship that would last until 1814. It relied on Berthier's complete acceptance of his subordinate role. He played no part in devising strategy, and never challenged or contradicted Napoleon except on points of logistical detail. When a friend queried his devotion to Napoleon, who was an extremely demanding and short-tempered boss, Berthier replied, Remember that one day it will be a fine thing to be second to Bonaparte. Berthier's hard work and brilliant staff system underpinned all Napoleon's successes in Italy and beyond. They spent so much time together, Berthier was nicknamed Napoleon's wife. He was personally brave too, leading an attack at Lodi and a cavalry charge at Rivoli. But his genius was for staff work and administration, not army command, as he well knew. When he briefly inherited command of the Army of Italy in 1797, he begged Napoleon to return as soon as possible to take over. Berthier played a crucial role in planning Napoleon's Egyptian expedition of 1798 and masterminded his famous crossing of the Alps in 1800, which saw French troops advance almost a hundred miles through the mountains in just eight days. The same year, Napoleon made Berthier Minister of War, putting him in charge of all French military administration. When Napoleon proclaimed his new empire in 1804, Berthier was the first name on the list of new marshals, with seniority over all others. The next year, his role as Chief of Staff, or Major General of the Grande Armée, was officially confirmed. In the fast-moving campaign of 1805, Berthier's system ensured Napoleon always had up-to-date information about the location and strength of his own forces, as well as the latest reports on enemy movements, from scouts, spies and prisoners. Such advantages helped him achieve the stunning encirclement of Mack's Austrian army at Ulm. On campaign, Berthier and the Emperor often travelled together in the Imperial coach, working without pause. His workload was immense, but so too were the rewards. Following the victory at Austerlitz, Napoleon made Berthier the hereditary sovereign prince of Neuchâtel and Valangin with an enormous private income. Over the course of Napoleon's reign, he received endowments worth more than a million francs per year from the Emperor, more than any other marshal. Yet Berthier remained a liability as a field commander. In 1809, Napoleon put him in temporary command of the Army of Germany. When Archduke Charles made a bold advance into Bavaria, Berthier's response was hesitant and muddled, and nearly led to Marshal Davout's corps being encircled. Only Napoleon's arrival averted disaster. 
Returning to his usual role as Chief of Staff, Berthier once more proved his exceptional talents, coordinating the movement of 200,000 men and paving the way for the Emperor's victory at Wagram. The title Prince of Wagram was added to his honours. The invasion of Russia in 1812 was a test like no other for Marshal Berthier and his staff. It required coordinating the movement of half a million troops, the biggest army ever seen in Europe, across a 400-mile front. A simple private is happier than I, Berthier complained. I am being killed by all this work. By August, it was clear the Grande Armée's supply lines were at breaking point, and Berthier was among those who tried to persuade Napoleon to halt the advance at Smolensk. He was ignored. As disaster engulfed the army, Berthier continued to perform his duty. By the end of the retreat, he was marching on foot with frostbitten fingers. When Napoleon left the army to return to Paris without him, he wept openly. Despite his own poor health in the wake of the retreat, Berthier worked hard to salvage the remnants of the army and served throughout the campaign in Germany in 1813. By now, Napoleon's enemies had reformed their own army general staffs, partly inspired by Berthier's example. But neither Berthier nor his system was perfect. In May, a confusing order to Marshal Ney contributed to his late arrival at the Battle of Bautzen, and a missed chance to crush the coalition army. Berthier was also notorious for his jealousies and grudges, his pedantic vendetta against Jomini, Ney's talented chief of staff, drove him to defect to the Russians. Berthier must also bear some blame for the disastrous end to the Battle of Leipzig. He knew there weren't enough bridges for the army to retreat safely, but failed to press the matter with Napoleon. When the only bridge out of the city was blown too early, 30,000 men became prisoners. Berthier continued to serve Napoleon faithfully through the desperate defence of France until the Emperor's abdication in April 1814. The restored Bourbon monarchy showered titles and honours on Berthier. The King even gave him an honorary rank in his own guard. Napoleon's return from exile 11 months later put him in an impossible situation, torn both ways by his sense of duty and loyalty. He accompanied the King on his flight to the Netherlands, but was treated with such suspicion by the royal court that he left for his wife's family estate in Bavaria. There, a few weeks later, Berthier fell from a window and was killed. It was most likely a simple accident, though some believe he killed himself out of guilt or despair, or, less plausibly, was murdered by French royalist agents. Napoleon had expected Berthier to rejoin him in 1815, and was scathing of his absence. I have been betrayed by Berthier, who was just a gosling, transformed by me into some kind of eagle. But after his defeat at Waterloo, in which mismanaged staff work played an important role, Napoleon conceded, if Berthier had been there, I would not have met this misfortune. <laughs> Berthier had none of Murat's glamour, nor Ney's heroism, nor the tactical instincts of Davout. But he was the indispensable marshal, whose brilliant administration and tireless work were the foundation for so much of Napoleon's military success. Two. Wow. I have the ability to help people escape reality, at least for the next week or so. I make my... Cool. Two. Marshal Lan. By the way, Bertie A. Is that how you say his name? I just listened to it about a hundred times. Um, he's moved up my list. He's, he had truly become a superior being by the time he perished. I found him a pygmy, but I 
but I lost a giant. Okay. Jean Lannes was a farmer's son from Gascony, who quit his job as a dyer's apprentice to join the local volunteer battalion in 1792. Energetic and charismatic, he was immediately elected to be an officer by his comrades. The unit was sent to fight the Spanish on the Eastern Pyrenees front, where Lan proved a brave and active officer. He distinguished himself in several actions and was promoted to command the regiment. Lan was then transferred to Italy as part of General Augereau's division, where his bold, aggressive leadership won praise from General Massena and then a Dago from General Bonaparte himself, who rewarded Lan with command of a grenadier brigade in the army's advance guard. A month later, at the Battle of Lodi, Colonel Lan was first across the river, leaping off the bridge and wading ashore under enemy fire. At the Battle of Arcole, he was wounded twice, but when he heard the French were retreating, he left the dressing station my birthday. Not that year, obviously. I was born in 1797. But look, that's my birthday. They were fighting to on my lead birthday, a fresh guys. attack, which probably saved Napoleon from capture or worse. Napoleon later presented the flag he'd waved at the battle to Lan, and a special bond was formed between them, based on mutual respect and loyalty. Lan was promoted to Brigadier General, and in 1798 joined Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. He played a prominent role in the campaign, helping to suppress the revolt in Cairo, and leading the assaults on Jaffa and Acre, where he was shot in the neck, and only saved from certain death by his men, who carried him back to safety. At the Battle of Abukir, Lan's infantry worked with Murat's cavalry to inflict a crushing defeat on the Ottoman army. While recovering from his latest wounds in this battle, Lan received painful news from home. His wife had given birth to another man's child. Oh my he returned God. to France with Napoleon in October, and divorced his wife not long after. When Napoleon staged his coup of 18 Brumaire, Lan helped to ensure the army's loyalty. The next spring, Napoleon's army marched over the Alps into Italy. Lan's vanguard led the way, and at Montebello encountered an Austrian force that outnumbered it two to one. Lan was able to win a brilliant victory, thanks to crucial support from General Victor. Just five days later, his division played a key role in Napoleon's great victory at Marengo. Lan never forgot a favour. He and Victor remained firm friends. But he also never forgot a grudge, was notoriously <laughs> short-fused, and quick to perceive an insult. I've been told that I can um, hold a grudge. In 1800, Lan remarried to Louise Antoinette Guernuc, daughter of a senator with whom he'd have five children. He was also appointed commander of Napoleon's Consular Guard, but he was dismissed after General Bessières helped expose his mismanagement of the budget, for which Lan never forgave him. Of course he In semi-disgrace, Lan was sent as ambassador to Portugal, a short, eventful spell in which, against expectation, his soldierly manner won over Portugal's Prince Regent. By 1804, it was clear that all was forgiven. Lan received news that he'd been made a marshal of the new French Empire, and orders to return to Paris for Napoleon's coronation. The following year, he took command of 5th Corps of the Grande Armée, forming the vanguard for the advance against the Austrian army in Bavaria. Lan had to work closely with Marshal Murat, a bitter rival since a falling out in Egypt but they put their differences aside. Together, they bluffed an Austrian commander into surrendering a vital Danube bridge by persuading him that an armistice had been signed. At one point, Lan even snatched the fuse from a soldier's hand as he prepared to light the explosive charges. The day before the Battle of Austerlitz, 
Lannes' quick temper got the better of him. He demanded to fight a duel with Marshal Soult, who in his eyes had made him look foolish in front of the Emperor. Soult ignored the challenge. In the battle that followed, Lannes' V Corps held the left flank against Bagration's attacks, later pushing forward with the cavalry to help take 7,000 Russian prisoners. After the battle, Lannes was infuriated that Soult, and not he, was singled out for praise by the Emperor. Within days, Lannes had resigned his command and returned to France. In 1806, with tempers cooled, Napoleon summoned Lann to rejoin the army for the war with Prussia. Back in command of V Corps, Lann was as active, aggressive and brilliant as ever. At Saalfeld, he fought the first major combat of the war, routing a Prussian division commanded by Prince Louis Ferdinand. Four days later, at Jena, Lann opened the main French attack at dawn, with General Suchet's division in the lead. For six hours, his troops were engaged in furious fighting for the villages on the plateau. Until finally, the Prussian resistance was broken. By December, the war had moved into Poland. Lan attacked a larger Russian force at Bultusk, but it was a bloody, indecisive affair. Wounds and fever then forced him to convalesce in Warsaw, and so missed the Battle of Eylau. That spring, Lann resumed command of the advance guard, as Napoleon sought out Bennigsen's Russian army, hoping to force a decisive battle. When Bennigsen located Lann's apparently isolated corps near Friedland, he attacked. He expected an easy victory, but Lann, with support from future marshals Udino and Grouchy, expertly used his troops to fend off the Russians while Napoleon raced to join him with the main army. Lannes' delaying tactics allowed Napoleon to catch the Russian army with its back to the river, and inflict a crushing defeat. The following year, Lannes was ennobled as Duke of Montebello, and joined Napoleon for the invasion of Spain, despite suffering a serious riding injury en route. Taking command of Marshal Monse's Third Corps, Lann routed a Spanish army at the Battle of Tuthela, sending the enemy fleeing in two directions. He was then given command of the Siege of Zaragoza. Spanish soldiers and civilians defended the city with legendary courage, but Lann's leadership and methodical house-by-house -house approach ensured ultimate victory at a high price. Even Lan was left shaken by the savagery of the fighting, writing to Napoleon, Sire, this is a horrifying war. Wow. Napoleon recalled Lan for the war with Austria in 1809. His provisional corps formed the vanguard for Napoleon's four-day campaign, a series of quick victories over the Austrians that culminated in the Battle of Egmund. Napoleon next needed Regensburg taken quickly, and so, as usual, he turned to Lann. After the first assault wave was mown down, Lann's call for volunteers went unanswered. <laughs> Furious, he picked up a scaling ladder and shouted, I'll show you that before I was a marshal I was a grenadier, and still am. As he rushed forward, his aides grabbed the ladder from him, reorganised the men, and led a successful attack. After occupying Vienna, Napoleon ordered his army to cross the Danube in pursuit of the Austrians. Marshals Lann and Massena led the way across improvised bridges, supported by Marshal Bessières' cavalry. It was soon clear that Napoleon had miscalculated, and that they faced not just an Austrian rearguard, but the full might of Archduke Charles's army. Massena held the village of Aspern, while Lann organised the defence of Essling. But desperately needed reinforcements and ammunition I were held this. up, as the Austrians floated obstacles downriver to smash the fragile bridges. Lann's old rival, Marshal Bessier, was placed under his temporary command. 
Lannes sent repeated orders for him to charge the enemy, in language that verged on an accusation of cowardice, and that evening the two marshals nearly came to blows. The next day, Lannes' corps led an attack on the Austrian centre, but was driven back by the weight of enemy fire. The French-held villages were under constant, pulverising bombardment. Around 4pm, Lannes' old friend, General Pouzet, was hit by a cannonball and killed in front of him. Lan, badly shaken, walked off to sit alone for a moment, when a cannonball skipped along the ground and smashed both his legs. Oh, Lan was carried to the rear, and placed in the care of the Grande Armée's most famous surgeon, Baron Larray. Larray quickly decided that he must amputate one leg. The operation went well, but the wound became infected, and Lan died nine days later. Oh, wow. Napoleon, who had visited Lan every day, wept at news of his death. What a loss for France, and for me. Then he wrote to Lan's wife. The Marshal has died this morning of the wounds he received on the field of honour. My pain equals yours. I lost the most distinguished general in my army, and a companion in arms for 16 years, whom I considered my best friend. Marshal Lannes' death was a great blow to Napoleon and the army. He had proved himself an outstanding commander. As brave as Ney, with the military mind of Soult, the Marshal who led Napoleon's vanguard in four of his greatest campaigns. His remarkable soldiering skills would be sorely missed by the Emperor in the challenging years that lay ahead. <clears throat> Hold on. Does anyone think that if Lan had lived, Would it have made a difference? I mean, look, you could say a few of these guys, a, chain, a, t a little change here and there, a tweak, a little less aggressive, more aggressive, better defense, you know, whatever. Um, do you think that loss was as bad for Napoleon as it could have been? I don't know what this guy is in terms of excuse me um I, I, I'm trying not to read if they die anymore I'm just because I don't want to know um but do you, do you think that Napoleon would have had better better odds at uh, let's say well would he have even came back if um, Napoleon was was exiled would he have joined up with him again would he have had a better shot at Waterloo with with him uh, that's what's great about this you can ask these questions but there's no guaranteed answer I could hear 50 yeah definitely would have had a better shot and I could hear 50 Nah, I don't know if it would have made much of a difference and you you're both right it's just it's opinion I'm just curious what other people think on that. Because, you know, we, we really have no idea. 1. Marshal Davout. Davout was one of the pure, purest. Louis Nicolas Davout was born into a noble family from Burgundy, with a tradition of military service that went back to the Crusades. At 15, he was sent to the military school in Paris just missing a young Napoleon Bonaparte, who'd graduated a few weeks before. In 1788, Davout was commissioned into the Royal Champagne Cavalry Regiment. But within a year, his vocal support for the French Revolution had got him into deep trouble. He was forced to resign his co Give me a second.
Sorry. Mission and spent six weeks in prison. In 1791. Hey, hey. Storming of the Bastille. This is the official key. I stole it from Mount Vernon. That's a lie. But, you know. This is. Uh, and I showed it in a previous video. It's my. Hmm. I got it. It's a paperweight. It's, it's a. It's a. I don't know, maybe a pound and a half, two pounds, something like that. Um, God damn, that's heavy. Um, yeah, it's just uh, cast iron. That's the that's what I was trying to think of last time. It's just a big cast iron key, obviously, as the original is. But I'm with you, France. Davu joined a local volunteer battalion and was elected its deputy commander. The next year, France was at war with Austria and Prussia, and Davu soon proved himself a brave, highly organised and energetic officer. He also won praise for attempting to prevent his commanding officer, General Dumouriez, defecting to the Austrians, though he was not successful. The incident did speed Davu's promotion to Brigadier General, but the revolution was now entering its most extreme phase. A new law barred ex-aristocrats from the army, and Davu had to resign his commission once more. A year passed before he was reinstated, with command of a cavalry brigade in the army of the Moselle. He led a series of daring operations against the Austrians, winning particular praise from General de Say, who became a close friend. In 1798, de Say introduced Davu to his friend, General Bonaparte. Napoleon was not at first impressed. Davu was aloof, untidy and awkward. Napoleon even described him as a damn brute. But he did trust de Say's judgement, and gave Davu a command in his army bound for Egypt. You cannot judge a book by its cover. It was a tough campaign for Davu who caught dysentery in Cairo. But he further demonstrated his military skill, winning a series of skirmishes on de Say's expedition into Upper Egypt, and later leading a successful assault on the town of Aboukir. Soon after their return to France, General de Say was killed at the Battle of Marengo, robbing Davou of a close friend and patron. However, Napoleon had been won over by Davout's performance in Egypt. He now promoted him General of Division, and appointed him Inspector General of Cavalry. Napoleon also encouraged Davout to marry Amy Leclerc, Pauline Bonaparte's sister-in-law, bringing Davout within the First Consul's extended family. It proved a loving marriage, and a great source of strength to Davout in the years ahead. In 1803, Davout was given command of the Camp of Bruges, where troops were preparing for the invasion of England. Here, he established his reputation as an exceptional administrator and hard taskmaster, enforcing discipline and regular training, while paying attention to his soldiers' welfare and sacking officers who didn't meet his high standards. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed a new French empire and Davout, aged 34, became the youngest of its new marshals. His inclusion was a surprise to many, especially as he'd still not commanded anything larger than a brigade in battle. It's very likely that the deaths of Davout's patron, de Say, and brother-in-law, Leclerc, cleared a path for him. The next year, Davout's troops became Third Corps of the Grande Armée, and marched east to take on the Third Coalition. On the eve of the Battle of Austerlitz, Davout force-marched his corps 70 miles in two days, arriving at dawn on Napoleon's right flank. His troops went straight into action, holding off a powerful coalition attack, buying time for Napoleon's decisive move against the enemy centre. It was a remarkable performance by Third Corps, soon eclipsed by an even greater feat of arms the next year in the war against Prussia. As Napoleon concentrated his forces at Jena to attack what he believed was the main Prussian army, 
he ordered Davout's Third Corps and Bernadotte's First Corps to cut off their retreat. But ten miles north of Napoleon, near Auerstedt, Davout ran straight into the main Prussian army. With no sign of support from Marshal Bernadotte's First Corps, Davout's 26,000 men faced odds of more than two to one. Oh, wow. Davout's masterful handling of his troops enabled Third Corps to repel the Prussian onslaught. Then, his line stabilised, Davout went on the offensive and routed the enemy army. It was a stunning victory, won at a high price. One in four of Davout's men were either killed or wounded. Yeah. When Napoleon heard... Yeah, you're, you're taking on a group that was... What, he had 26,000, they had 63,000, something like that? Yeah. You, you can't afford to lose that many. They can. They're going to inflict a hell of a lot more damage. And I think they probably fled because they realized, oh, they're not backing down. And, and I'm not taking anything away from him. He, he was doing a hell of a job, you know. At the first report, he was incredulous. Your marshal must have been seeing double, he told his aide-de-camp, making a joke of Davout's spectacle wearing. When the report was confirmed, he sent a message back to Davout. Tell the marshal that he his generals and his troops have gained everlasting claims on my gratitude. He later gave Third Corps the honour of being the first troops to enter Berlin. The next year, at Eylau, Davout's corps again played a pivotal role, trying to turn the Russian flank. When his men were driven back, Davout rallied them, shouting, The cowards will die in Siberia, the brave will die on the field of honour. This time, Third Corps could not break through, but its tenacity helped persuade the Russians to retreat that night. Following the peace treaty of Tilsit, Davu became Governor-General of the new Duchy of Warsaw, where he oversaw the recruitment and training of Polish troops. In 1808, he was ennobled as Duke of Auerstedt. But for all his military prowess, Davu was not a popular figure. Notoriously tough, his troops respected rather than loved him, while several marshals were irritated by his air of superiority and blunt manner. In 1809, with war looming with Austria, Davout rejoined Third Corps at Regensburg. When Archduke Charles advanced into Bavaria, the army's temporary commander, Marshal Berthier, nearly left Davout to be cut off. As soon as Napoleon arrived, he ordered Davout to withdraw. It was almost too late, but with immense skill, Davout and Third Corps were able to fight their way clear and rejoin the army. Davout played a major part in the counter-offensive that followed, known as the Four-Day Campaign, pinning Austrian forces at Egmul, until Napoleon arrived to deliver the decisive blow. A month later, at the Battle of Aspern, Davout and Third Corps never made it across the river. The Marshal's role was limited to trying to sort out the crisis at the bridges, until the French were forced to withdraw. When the army crossed the Danube again six weeks later, Davout was in his usual post on the right wing. On the first day of the Battle of Wagram, the Emperor criticised Davout for his slow attack. But the Iron Marshal, as he was now known, was saving his men for what he knew lay ahead. The next day, Davout's troops fought off a major Austrian dawn assault, then launched their own attack, gradually driving in the enemy left flank, helping to make Austrian retreat inevitable. Davout and his corps had emerged from another major campaign as so he anticipated they were going to attack early that morning, so that's why he held back that first day. I, that's, that's what I'm guessing. Interesting. Interesting. Heroes. The grateful Napoleon bestowed on him a new title, Prince of Egmul. For a few years there was peace in Central Europe, 
Davout spent most of it in Hamburg, in his new role as Governor-General of the Hanseatic cities, cracking down on corruption and illegal trade with Britain. In 1812, Napoleon entrusted him with the enormous task of organising the Grande Armée for the invasion of Russia. Davout's first corps alone was 72,000 strong, as big as Napoleon's entire army at Austerlitz. When it crossed the Nyman River in June, its troops were so well turned out that one observer compared them to the Imperial Guard itself. Davout's giant corps was the spear tip of Napoleon's invasion. He mauled Bagration's second army at Saltanovka, but could not prevent its escape. Three weeks later, his troops were in the thick of the fighting at Smolensk. But Davout's lack of allies among the other marshals began to show. Many were keen to see him taken down a peg or two, including Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, and perhaps even the Emperor himself. When Davout got into a row with Marshal Murat, whom he regarded as incompetent, Napoleon decided in Murat's favour, giving him one of Davout's divisions. So was Napoleon kind of a little jealous that this guy was a good military commander and so he kinda I mean to have that much ego you want to take your own guy down a little bit to me it just makes you a scumbag on the eve of the Battle of Borodino the Emperor dismissed Davout's request to outflank the Russian defenses you are always for turning the enemy he told him it is too dangerous a movement. In the bloody battle that followed, Davout's corps led the frontal attack on the flesh earthworks. The Marshal himself was injured when his dying horse rolled over him, but remained on the field directing the attack, which was, ultimately, successful. Six weeks later, the Grande Armée began its infamous retreat from Moscow. The remains of Davout's corps was ordered to form the rearguard, but he was criticised for moving too slowly. Near Vyazma, a gap opened up, and Russian General Miloradovich pounced. First corps was routed, and saved only by the quick intervention of Marshal Ney, Eugène and Poniatowski. Ney's corps took over as rearguard, but when he became cut off at Krasny, Davout was widely blamed for not turning back to rescue him, even though it would have been suicidal. The moment highlighted the gulf in charisma between a marshal like Ney, who was loved by the troops, and Davout, who was not. Davout began the 1813 campaign holding Dresden, but when Hamburg was raided by Russian Cossacks, Napoleon sent him north to organise the city's defence. Exactly why Napoleon kept his best marshal in Hamburg, while a decisive campaign raged in Saxony, continues to puzzle historians. Davout was a stern and effective governor of Hamburg, securing the Lower Elbe River and Napoleon's strategic northern flank. He organised a new 13th Corps, and following Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig, withstood a six-month siege. Davout only surrendered Hamburg in May 1814, after confirmation arrived of Napoleon's abdication. But what difference the Iron Marshal might have made at Bautzen, Denewitz, Leipzig or Long remains a tantalising what-if. Davout was not welcomed into the restored Bourbon regime like other marshals. His loyalty to Napoleon was despised by the ultra-royalists. Instead, he was forced into retirement and put under police surveillance. When Napoleon returned to France in 1815, Davout and Lefebvre were the only marshals waiting to greet him at the Tuileries Palace. But once again, Napoleon gave Davout a role which, in hindsight, seems a disastrous waste of his ability. Davout was made Minister of War and Governor of Paris vital roles requiring a brilliant and loyal administrator, and Davout worked miracles to raise a new army for Napoleon's final campaign. 
But if Davout, not Grouchy, had commanded the Emperor's right wing in 1815, who knows what might have been. Following the Emperor's defeat at Waterloo, Davout organised the defence of Paris and urged Napoleon to fight on. Later accepting that he must abdicate, Davout ensured Napoleon's safe passage to the coast, and submitted to the Bourbons. The Royalists had promised Davout that his officers would not be prosecuted for their conduct. He was furious to discover these assurances would not be honoured. He also testified on behalf of Marshal Ney, but could not save him from a firing squad. Davout was stripped of his rank and income, though they were restored two years later, thanks to the intercession of Marshal Macdonald. Davout shunned court, as he always had. His health was failing, and in 1821, the death of his eldest daughter left him grief-stricken. He died two years later of tuberculosis, aged 53. Davout, the youngest and least proven of Napoleon's marshals, proved the most capable of all. Cool under fire, and a brilliant tactician, he was the ideal corps commander in battle. A superb administrator, he was a stern and loyal deputy for the Emperor in Poland and Germany. His main weakness was his severe and blunt manner, which won few friends and left some even wishing to see him fail. I gotta say, that's probably something that a lot of, a lot of military marshals, generals, whatever you want to call it, that's a, I think where a lot of failure comes in, is that they're just too blunt, which I think is good, you know, just to be that forward with things. You, you know what you get with that person. They're going to tell you what's great and what's BS. And that, that's what you need. Some people just don't want to hear that. They want, they want you to tell them that their ideas are good. You know, coddle them. And people like this who speak up were like, no. That's, no. It's garbage. You can't do this, you know. Sometimes those those are the people who pay a price, you know, and, and it's it's sad because you need people like that who are going to be blunt, and a lot of times it just doesn't happen. You get yet yeah, not something. You get a lot of yes men, and you don't want a yes man. Yes man, you don't want a yes man. You don't want someone who's going to agree with you and tell you what you want to hear. You need him they saw from the Iron Marshal very often. Or you need her. Huh? See? I'm open. So concludes our ranking of Napoleon's Marshals. 26 dramatic lives that reflect a tumultuous age. Products of a military meritocracy forged in the French Revolution skills honed by two decades of war, their fates entwined in the rise and fall of empires. History may never see such an extraordinary, diverse and colourful collection of military commanders again. Thank you to all the I would love to see an American one of these, you know, for the Revolutionary War. I think that would be pretty cool. You know, as to what their opinion would be. As to who would be the best. Obviously, we didn't have marshals. But, you know, the commanders, generals, stuff like that. I think that would be pretty good. This is really good. This is really good. This is really good. That's all I can say. This is really good. I'll say it again. Um, right now, I've started... Well, I've, I'm finished. The Alexander the Great series. But I put the first video up today. It's Friday. It's uh, about 8.30 at night. And... Um, <sighs> alcohol burps. Sorry. 
and um, I'm going to be doing the Congress of Vienna next. <laughs> wow, keep burping. But until that one's out, it doesn't really matter because I haven't done it yet. But this was really good. The whole Napoleon series was really good. I, I, I'm. This it, it was it was very entertaining, very, very knowledgeable, and I'm glad I did it. Um, but on to the next one, right? So I appreciate you watching, and uh, have a good day. Have a good night.